Section Seven of Mr. Fortune's Practice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Snowball Burglary. A telegraph was brought to Mr. Fortune. It announced that the woman whom his ingenuity convicted of the Van Stanton murder had confessed it in prison just after the home secretary decided not to hang her mr fortune sighed satisfaction and took his hostess in to dinner he was staying in a devonshire country house for mental repose this is not much like him for safe on visits of duty country houses seldom receive him the conversation of the county he complains is too great a strain upon his intellect also he had no interest in killing creatures except professionally but the output of crime had been large that winter and the task of keeping scotland yard straight laborious and he sought relief with colonel beach at creston riggers for tom beach once in the first flight of hunting men having married a young wife put central heat and electric light into a remote tudor manor house and retired there to grow iris and poultry neither poultry nor young wives allured reg fortune but gardens he loves and his own iris are not satisfying him so he sat by alice beach at her table and while her talk flowed on like the brook in the poem while he wondered why men marry since the bachelor dinners were better eating surveyed with mild eyes her and her guests tom beach had probably been unable to help marrying her she was so pink and white and round her eyes so shy and innocent she was one of those women who make it instantly clear to men that they exist to be married and tom beach has always done his duty but she is not such a fool as she looks reggie had pronounced with pity if not sympathy he glanced down the table at tom beach that large red honest man who sat doing his best between dignity and impudence dignity in the awful person of mrs fox and the mighty pretty impudence of his wife's sister sally winsley mrs fox has been described as one who could never be caught bending or a model of the art of the corset she is spare she is straight and few have seen her exhibit interest in anything but other people's incomes which she always distrusts a cracked woman but for a habit of wearing too many jewels what she was doing in tom beach's genial house was plain enough her son had brought her to inspect the sally winslow as a man brings a vat to the horse he fancies but it was not plain why alexander fox fancied sally winslow imagine a bulldog after a butterfly but bulldogs have a sense of humour sally winslow is a wisp of a creature who has no respect for anyone even herself under her bright bubbled hair indeed it's the dentist colour but when some fellow said she had the face of a fairy a woman suggested the face of a fairy's maid she listened to alexander's heavy talk and watched him in a fearful fascination but sometimes she shot a glance across the table where a little man with a curly head and a roguish eye was eating his dinner demurely his worst enemies never thought that captain barney carston's manners were bad now you knew them all when they made up a fall for bridge upon which miss fox always insists it was inevitable that rage fortune should stand out for his simple mind declines to grasp the principles of cards alexander fox in his masterful way directed sally to the table and scared but submissive she sat down and giggled nervously 
Reggie found himself left to his hostess and Captain Coston. They seemed determined to entertain him, and he sighed and listened. So he says he's emphatic that he did not go to sleep. But the study of the events of that evening, which afterwards became necessary, makes it clear that a long time passed before Alice Beach was saying the first thing that he remembers. Did you ever know a perfect crime, Mister Fortune? Mister Fortune then sat up, as he records, and took notice. Captain Corston burst out laughing and departed. Hammering a stave of "Meet me tomorrow in Dreamland," Mister Fortune gazed at his hostess. He had not supposed that she could say anything so sensible. Most crimes are perfect, he said. But how horrible! I should hate to be murdered and know there wasn't a clue who did it. Oh, there will be a clue, all right," Reggie assured her. Are you sure? And will you promise to catch my murder, Mister Fortune? Well, you know, he conceded her round, amiable face. If you are murdered, it would be a case of art for art's sake. That's very rare. I was speaking scientifically. A perfect crime is a complete series of cause and effect. Where you have that, there is always a clue. There is always evidence. And when you get to work on it, the unknown quantities come out. Yes, most crimes are perfect, but you must allow for chance. Sometimes the criminal is an idiot. That's a nuisance. Sometimes he has a strike of luck, and the crime is damaged before we find it. Something has been washed out. A bit of it has been lost. It is imperfect crimes that give trouble. But how fascinating! Oh Lord, no," said Mister Fortune. The bridge players are getting up. Sally Winsley was announcing that she had lost all but honor. Mrs. Fox wore a ruthless smile. Sally went off to bed. Oh, Mrs. Fox! Her sister cried. Do come. Mister Fortune is lecturing on crime. Really. How very interesting," said Mrs. Fox, and transfixed Reggie with an icy stare. The perfect crime in one lesson. Alice Beach laughed. I feel a frightful character already. All you want is luck, you know, or else Mr. Fortune catches you every time. I say, you know, Alice. Her husband protested. A scream rang out. Alice stopped laughing. The little company looked at each other. Where was that? Tom Beach muttered. Not in the house, Colonel. Fox said. Certainly not in the house. Tom Beach was making for the window when all the lights went out. Alice gave a cry. The shrill voice of Mrs. Fox arose to say, "Really." Colonel Beach could be heard swearing. Don't let us get excited," said Fox. Rage fortune strike a march. Excited, be damned," said Tom Beach, and rang the bell. Rage fortune, holding his march aloft, made for the door and opened it. The hall was dark too. Oh Lord! It's the Manfields blow out. Tom Beach groaned. Or something has happened in your little power station. Said Reg Fortune cheerfully, and his host snorted, for the electricity at Christen Ridges comes from turbines on the stream, which used to fill the Tudor fish ponds. And Colonel Beach loves his machinery like a mother. He shouted to the butler to bring candles, and out of the dark, the voice of the butler was heard apologizing. He rode to the chauffeur, who was his engineer. To put in a new fuse, it is not the fuse, Colonel," came a startled voice. "There is no juice." Colonel Beach swore the more. "Run down to the power house, confound you! Where the devil are those candles?" "Really?" said Mrs. Fox in the dark. 
for Reggie had grown tired of striking marches. Most inconvenient. So in the dark they waited, and again they heard a scream. It was certainly in the house this time. It came from upstairs. It was in the voice of Sally Winsley. Reggie Fortune felt someone bumping against him, and knew by the weight it was Fox. Reggie struck another match. And saw him vanish into the darkness above, as he called, "Mrs. Vanslow, Mrs. Vanslow." There was the sound of a scuffle and a thud. Colonel Beach stormed upstairs. A placid voice spoke out of the dark at Reggie's ear, "I say, what's up with the jolly old house?" The butler arrived, quivering with a candle in each hand. And a bodyguard of candle-bearing satellites, and showed him the smiling face of Captain Coston. From above, Colonel Beach rode for lights. The C.O. sounds peeved," said Captain Coston. "Someone's for it. What?" They took the butler's candles and ran up, discovering with the light Mr. Fox holding his face together. "Hello, hello." Dirty work at the crossroads. What? Why, Sally? Good God! On the floor of the passage, Sally Vinsley lay like a child asleep. One frail bare arm flung up above her head. Look at that, Fortune! Tom Beach cried. Damned scoundrels! Hold the candle, said Red Fortune. But as he kneeled beside her. The electric light came on again. Great Jimmy, Captain Coston exclaimed, "Who did that?" Don't play the fool, Bonnie," Tom Beach grumbled. "What have they done to her, Fortune?" Reggie's plump, capable hands were moving upon the girl delicately, knocked her out, he said, and stared down at her, and rubbed his chin. Who? What? How? Coston cried. Hello, Fox. What's your trouble? Who hit you? How on earth should I know? Fox mumbled, still feeling his face as he peered at the girl. When Mister Winslow screamed, I ran up. It was dark, of course. Some man caught hold of me. I strike out, and they sat on me. I was knocked down. I wish you would look at my eye, Fortune. Reggie was looking at Sally, whose face had begun to twitch. Your eye will be a merry color tomorrow, Carsten assured him. But who hit Sally? It was the fellows who sat upon me, I suppose. Of course, they are attacking her when I rescued her. Stout fellow said Carsten. How many were there? Quite a number, quite. How can I possibly tell? It was dark. Quite a number. Sally tried to sneeze and felt, opened her eyes and murmured, "The light, the light." She saw the man about her and began to laugh hysterically. "Good God! The scoundrels may be in the house still!" cried Tom Beach. "Come on, Coston." "I should say so," said Captain Coston, but he lingered over Sally. All right now," he asked anxiously. "Oh, Barney," she choked in her laughter. "Yes, yes, I'm all right. Oh, Mister Fortune, what is it? Oh, poor Mister Fox, what has happened?" "Just so," said Reggie. He picked her up and walked off with her to her bedroom. "Oh, you are strong," she said, not coquetting. But in honest surprise, like a child, Reggie laughed. There is nothing of you, and he laid her down on her bed. Well, what about it? I feel muzzy. That will pass off," said Reggie cheerfully. "Do you know what hit you? No, isn't it horrid? It was all dark, you know. There is no end of a bruise." She felt behind her ear and made a face. I know, I know," Rich murmured sympathetically. 
and how did it all begin? Why, I came to bed, Mister Fortune. Heavens, there may be a man in here now. She writes to herself. Yes, we had better clean that up," said Reggie, and looked under the bed and opened the wardrobe and thrust into her dress, and turned back to her. No luck, Mrs. Winslow. Oh, thank goodness! She sank down again. You see, I came up and put the light on. Of course, there was a man at the window there. Then I screamed. The first scream, Reggie murmured. And then the lights went out. I ran away and tumbled over that chair, and then out into the passage. I kept bumping into things, and it was horrid. And then, oh, somebody caught hold of me, and I screamed. The second scream, Reggie murmured. I was sort of flung about. There were men there fighting in the dark, horrid, hitting all round me, you know. And then, oh well, I suppose I stopped one, didn't I? There was a tap at the door. May I come in, Doctor? Said Alice Beach. Oh, Alice, have they caught anyone? Not a creature. Isn't it awful? Oh, Sally, you poor darling. Her sister embraced her. What a shame! Is it bad? I'm all muddled. And Charlie saw, my dear, it is too bad it should be you. Oh, Mister Fortune, what did happen? Some fellow knocked her out. He will be all right in the morning, but keep her quiet and get her off to sleep. He went to the window. It was open and the curtains blowing in the wind. He looked out. A lady stood against the wall, and. That's that. Yes, put her to bed, Mrs. Beach. Outside in the passage, he found Captain Coston waiting. I say, Fortune, is she much hurt? She has taken a good hard knock. She's not made for it, but she will be all right. Sally, oh damn," said Coston. "Did you catch anybody? Nap or clear?" The colonel's going round to see if they got away with anything, and Fox wants you to look at his poor eye. Nothing of yours, Gun. Coston laughed. No, I'm not exactly the burglar's friend, don't you know? My family Jews won't please the haughty cook. I say it's a queer stunt, even being in one like it. I don't think it went according to plan," said Rage Fortune. He came down and found Fox with an eye dwindling behind a bruise of many colours, arguing with an agitated butler that the house must contain Annika. Before he could give the attention which Fox imperiously demanded, the parade voice of the colonel rang through the house. Fortune came up here. Tom Beach stood in the study where he writes the biographies of his poetry and his diaries. There also are kept the cups, medals, and other silver with which shows reward their beauty. Look at that! He cried with a tragic gesture. The black pedestals of the cups, the velvet cases of the medals stood empty. Great, Jimmy. Said Captain Coston in awe. Well, that's very true," said Reggie. And the next thing, please. Colonel Beach said it was a damn outrage. He also supposed that the fellows had stripped the whole place, and he bounced out. Reggie went to his own room. He had nothing which could be stolen but his brushes, and they are not gone. He looked out of the window. In the cold March moonlight, he saw two men moving hither and thither, and recognized the one for his shelter, and fucked it in Sam and shouted, "Nothing doing, sir." Sam called back, "Clean gate away." Reggie went downstairs to the smoking room. He was stretched in a chair, consuming soda water. 
and the large cigar when that broke upon him in a wave of chattering tom beach and alice and captain corston oh mr fortune is this a perfect crime alice laughed reggie shook his head i'm afraid it had been an accident in its yours the crime that took the wrong turning how do you mean fortune tom beach frowned it's deduced awkward awkward is the word reggie agreed what's gone colonel well that is my part you know and alice has lost a set of cameos she had in her dressing room pigs said alice with conviction and mrs fox says they have taken that big ruby brooch she was wearing before dinner you know it it's one of the things i could bear not to know reggie murmured nothing else she says she doesn't know she's too upset to be sure i say fortune this is a jolly business for me she's gone to bed fuming fox is in a sweet state too what's he lost only his eye cast and chucked that's a lot then nice little bag but rather on the small side yes it didn't go according to plan do said reggie reproachfully i where is the nearest policeman why here alice pointed at him christen abbas said tom beach and he is only a yoko village constable don't you know yes you are rather remote colonel what is that about you that brings the vilely cracksman down here mrs fox alice cried that woman must travel with a jeweller's shop that is a chance for you mr fortune get her ruby bag, and you will win her heart jeweled in fifteen holes i would be afraid of burglars miss speech you are frivolous and the colonel is going to burst into tears will any one tell me what did happen we were all in the drawing room no where were you coston writing letters here old thing quite so at the servants or in the servants hall at supper colonel beach said they are all right quite miss winslow went upstairs and saw a man at her window there is a lady at it she screamed and the lights went out why the rascals got at the powerhouse baker found the man switch off then they knew their way about here have you sucked any servants lately had any strange workmen in the place no yet the intelligence work was very sound well in the darkness miss winslow tumbled out into the passage and was grabbed and screamed and the brave fox ran upstairs and took a black eye and miss winslow took the cord and when we arrived there wasn't a burglar inside yes there was some luck about not for sally said her sister no said reggie thoughtfully no but there was a lot of luck going he surveyed them through his cigar smoke with a bland smile what do you think i ought to do fortune said tom beach go to bed said reggie what's the time time runs on doesn't it yes go to bed oh but mr fortune you are disappointing alice beach cried i am i notice it every day it's my only vice i do think you might be interested a poor crime but her own captain corston chucked it's no good miss speech it don't appeal to the master's mind you know fortune it's devilish awkward the colonel protested i'm sorry but what can we do you might call up your village policeman he's four miles off and i dare say he needs exercise you might telephone to Sultan and say you have been boggled, and while they please watch some road or other, 
for some one or other with a bag of silver and a set of camels and a ruby brooch. It doesn't sound helpful, does it? It sounds damned silly. But I thought you had found clues, Mr. Fortune. Alice Beach cried, all sorts of clues, fingerprints, and footprints, and and tell us the crime was done by a retired sergeant cook with pink hair and a cast in the eye. Carsten grinned. You see, I have no imagination," said Reggie sadly. "Confound you, Carsten! It isn't a joke," Colonel Beach cried. "No, I don't think it's a joke," Reggie agreed. "One of your perfect crimes, Mister Fortune." Well, I was saying, you have to allow for chance. There was a lot of luck about. What are you thinking of? The time, Mister Beach. Yes, the flight of time. We had better go to bed. But he did not go to bed. He stared at the fire in his bedroom and composed himself by it. The affair annoyed him. He did not want to be bothered by work, and his mind insisted on working. Something like this. Philosophically, time is an illusion. Time travels in diverse spaces. With diverse persons, highly diverse. Yes, time is the trouble, Colonel. Why was there such a long time between the first screen and the second screen? Sally tumbled down. Sally was fumbling in the dark, but it didn't take many minutes to get from her room to the stairs. She took as long as it took the chauffeur to run to the powerhouse. He started some while after the first screen. He had found what was wrong and put the light on again within a minute of the second. Too much time for Sally, and too little. How did Sally's burglars get off so quick? Fox ran up at the second screen. The rest of us were there next minute. They were there to hit Fox. When we came, we saw no one, heard no one, and found no one. He shook his head at the firelight, and yet Sally's rather a dear. I wonder. No, it didn't go according to plan. But I don't like it, my child. It don't look pretty. He sat up. Somebody was moving in the corridor. He went to his table for an electric torch. Slide silently across the room, flung open the door and flashed on the light. He caught a glimpse of legs vanishing round a corner, legs which were crawling, a man's legs. A door was closed stealthily. Reggie swept the light along the floor. It fell at last on some spots of candle grease dropped where the fallen Sally was examined. That about the legs had been. He moved the light to and fro. Close by stood an old oak settle. He swept the light about it, saw something beneath it flash, and picked up Mrs. Fox's big ruby brooch. The early morning, which he does not love, found him in the garden. There, under Sally's window, the lady still stood. That came from the parting shed, sir. His foxes and Sam told him. Matter of a hundred yards, together they went over the pass and away to the little power house by the stream. The ground was still hard from the night frost. Not a trace, Reggie murmured. Well, well, see anybody about this morning, Sam? This morning, sir. Sam stared. Not a soul. Have a look, said Reggie, and went in shivering. He was met by the butler, who said nervously that Colonel Beach had been asking for him and would like to see him in the study. There he found not only Colonel Beach, but Mrs. Beach and Sally and Captain Corston, a distressful company. It was plain that Mrs. Beach had been crying. Sally was on the brink. Corston looked like a naughty boy, uncertain of his doom. But the colonel was tragic. The colonel was taking things very hard. Rage fortune beamed upon them. Morning, morning, 
up already, Mrs. Winslow. How is the head? Sally tried to say something and gaped. Tom Beach broke out. Sorry to bother you, Fortune. It's an infernal shame dragging you into this business. He glared at his wife, and she waited. My dear Colonel, it's my job. Reggie protested cheerfully and edged towards the fire, which the Colonel screened. I'm awfully sorry, Colonel. I'm the one to blame. Carsten said, "It's all my fault, don't you know?" I don't know whose fault it isn't. I know it's almost a ghastly mess. It just like a snowball. Alice laughed hysterically. Our snowball burglary. Snowball! The colonel roared at her. Oh, Tom, you know when you want subscriptions and have a snowball where everyone has to get someone else to subscribe. I thought of it, and I brought in Sally. And Sally brought in Barney, and then Mr. Fox came in. Poor Mr. Fox! And then Mrs. Fox got into it, and her rubies. Yes, yes, that's very lucid," said Reggie. But a little confusing to an outsider. My brain is rather torpid, you know. I only wanted to get on the fire. He obtained the central position and sighed happily. Well, now. The working hypothesis is that there was no burglaries. Somebody thought it would be interesting to put up a perfect crime for the benefit of the guideless expert. They were stricken by a new spasm of dismay. They stared at him. Yes, you always knew it was a fake. Carsten cried. I guessed that last night when you kept talking about the time. Well, I thought a little anxious would be good for you. Even the expert has his feelings. It was horrid of us, Mister Fortune. Sally cried, but it wasn't any meat for you. Oh, don't discourage me. It was all my fault, Mister Fortune. Alice put in her claim and looked at him ruefully, and then began to laugh. But you did seem so bored. Oh no no no! Only my placid nature. Well, now to begin at the beginning. Somebody thought it would be a merry jest to have me on. That was you, Miss Beach. For your kindly interest, I thank you. Miss Beach again showed signs of weeping. Please don't be hurried, Mister Fortune," said Sally fervently. "I'm trying to be fascinating, but you see." I am so respectable. You unnerved me. I thought of a burglary," said Miss Beach, choking sobs. And I asked Sally to do it. And she did, all for my sake. Well, one never knows. Reggie sighed and looked sentimental. I wanted to shock Mr. Fox. Dear, dear, I shouldn't wonder if you have. Oh, Sally shuddered. That man is on my nerves. He simply follows me about. He scares me. When I found he had got Tom to ask him where I, yes, of course it's my fault. Tom Beach cried. I knew it would come round to that. You didn't know, dear. How could you? Sally soothed him. He doesn't make love to you. Well, he was here and his mama. And oh, Mister Fortune, you have seen them. They want shocking, so I talked to Barney and. And I came in with this feed," said Captain Corston. "My scheme, really, Fortune, all my scheme." Or Reggie asked with some emphasis. "Good Lord, not what happened! I thought we should come to that some day. What did happen?" And they all began to talk at once. From which two months emerged the clear little voice of Sally. Barney slept out early and put a garden ladder up at my window, and then went off to the power house. When I went to bed, I collected Tom's parts from the study. That was because he's so vain of them, and Alice's cameos. That's because they are so dowdy. 
and locked them in my trunk. Then I screamed at the window. That was the signal for Barney, and he switched the lights out and came back. All that was what we planned. She looked pathetically at Reggie. It was a good crime, wasn't it, Mr. Fortune? You have a turn for the profession, Miss Swenslow. You will try to be too clever. It's the mark of the criminal mind. I say, hang it all, Fortune. Carsten flushed. I know I spoiled it," said Sally meekly. "I just stood there, you know, hearing Tom roll downstairs and you all fuzzing, and you underwrite the policeman. Do I fuzz?" Reggie was annoyed. "You are fuzzling over my morals now." Well, I stood there, and it came over me the burglars just have to have something of Mrs. Fox. She giggled. That would make it quite perfect. So I ran into her room and struck a match, and that was her awful old ruby brooch. I took that and went out into the passage and screamed again. That was the plan. Then I bumped into somebody. That was me," said Captain Coston. She was such a jolly long time with the second scream. I went up to see if anything was wrong. Yes, the criminal will do too much," Reggie sighed. Then Fox came. He tumbled into us and hit out. Silly ass! I heard Sally go down and I let him have it. Confound him! Sally smiled at him affectionately. Oh yes, it's devilish funny, isn't it? Cried Tom Beach. Good God, Coston, you are not fit to be at large. A nice thing you have let me in for. Well, you have all been very ingenious," said Reggie. "Thanks for a very jolly evening. May I have some breakfast?" There was a silence which could be felt. "Yes, that's where we slipped up," said Coston. Sally must have dropped it when that fool knocked her out. I went out last night to hunt for it, and it wasn't there. Really, Reggie's tone was sardonic, and Carsten flushed at it. What do you mean? Well, somebody found it, I suppose. That's the working hypothesis. He reduced them to the dismal condition in which he found them. There you are, Colonel Beach cried. Some one of the servants saw the beastly thing and thought there was a chance to steal it. It's a ghastly business. I will have to go through them for it and catch some poor devil who would have gone straight enough if you hadn't played the fool. It's not fair, confound it. There was a tap at the door. Mrs. Fox was asking if the colonel could speak to her. The colonel grumbled and went out. Do you mind if I have some breakfast, Mrs. Beach? said Reggie plaintively. They seemed to think him heartless, but offered no impediment. A dejected company slinked downstairs. It occurred to Reggie, always just a man, but Sam also might be hungry, and he ran out to take him off guard. When he came back to the breakfast room, he found that Fox had joined the party. It was clear that no one had dared to tell him the truth. They were gazing in fascinated horror at the many colors which swelled about his right eye, and his scowl was terrible. "Hey, low fox, stout fellow," said Reggie brightly. "How is the head?" Mister Fox turned the scowl on him. Mister Fox found his head very painful. He had had practically no sleep. He feared some serious injury to the nerves. He must see a doctor, and his tone implied that, as a doctor and a man, Reggie was contemptible. Reggie served himself generously with bacon and mushrooms and began to eat. No one else was eating but Mr. Fox. He, in a dominion manner. Smoked boiled eggs, and others played with food like passengers in a rolling ship. The door was opened. 
the austere shape of mrs fox stalked in and behind her tom beach slink to his place mrs fox's compressed face wore a look of triumph sally half rose from her chair oh mrs fox she cried have you found your rubies really said mrs fox with a freezing smile no mrs winslow i have not found my rubies what are you going to do about it mrs fox stared at her i imagine there is only one thing to be done i have desired colonel beach to send for the police i should have thought that was obvious oh tom you mustn't sally cried really my dear you don't realize what you are saying yes i do you don't understand mrs fox you see it was like this and out it all came with the colonel trying to stop it in confused exclamations and mrs fox and her happy song sinking deeper and deeper into stupefaction the whole affair was a practical joke said fox sickly that's the idea ed thing coston assured him yes yes don't you see it sally giggled i never heard anything so disgraceful fox pronounced i say go easy coston cried mrs fox had became pale am i expected to believe this she looked from tom to alice oh mrs fox i'm so sorry alice beach said it was too bad and it's really all my fault i i you say you stole my rubies mrs fox turned upon sally come come the child took them for a joke colonel beach protested i took them yes and then i lost them i'm mostly awfully sorry about that are you indeed am i to believe this tale colonel beach then pray who stole my diamond neatness diamond neatness sally cried i never saw it my neatness is gone i don't profess to understand the ideas of joking in this house but my neatness is gone oh my lord said coston thus torn it the snowball alice gasped it's a snowball everything gets in something else really said mrs fox i do not understand you reggie arose and cut himself a large portion of cold beef if this was a practical joke said the sullen voice of a fox who strike me that was me old thing coston smiled upon him but strictly speaking said reggie as he came back and took more toast that's irrelevant colonel beach mrs fox commanded the rich man's attention what do you propose to do we shall have to have the police he groaned oh yes it's a case for the police said reggie cheerfully have you a telegraph form colonel it's all right fortune thanks i will telephone yes encourage local talent but i would like to send a wire to scotland yard scotland yard mrs fox was impressed mrs fox smiled on him well you know there are points about your case mrs fox i think they would be interested like one handling his own death warrant colonel beach put down some telegraph forms reggie put out his pencil laid it down again and took some marmalade valuable neatness of course mrs fox he said blandly quite so the one you wore the night before last i remember i remember he described it mrs fox approved and elaborated his description that's very clear are your jewels insured yes well that is a certain consolation he adjusted his pencil and wrote i think this will meet the case he gave the telegraph to mrs fox 
Mrs. Fox read it. Mrs. Fox seemed unable to understand. She continued to gaze at it, and the wandering company saw her grow red to the frozen coils of her hair. Reggie was making notes on another telegraph form. He read out slowly a precise description of the lost Nicholas. "That's it, then," he said. "By the way, who are you insured with?" Mrs. Fox glared at him. "I suppose this is another joke." No, Reggie shook his head. This has gone beyond a joke. Where is my brooch then? Who has my brooch? I have," said Reggie. He pulled it out of his pocket and laid it on her plate. I found the brooch in the passage. I didn't find the neatness, Mrs. Fox. So I should like to send that telegraph. You will do nothing of the kind. I won't have anything done. The whole affair is disgraceful, perfectly disgraceful. I forbid you to interfere. Do you understand? I forbid it, Colonel Beach. It is impossible for me to stay in your house after the way in which you have allowed me to be treated. Please order the car. She stalked out of the room. Fortune said, "Fox thunderously, will you kindly explain yourself?" I don't think I need explaining, but you might ask your mother. She kept the telegraph, and to his mother, Mister Fox fled. Good God, Fortune! What have you done? Tom Beach groaned. Not a nice woman," said Reggie sadly. Not really a nice woman. He stood up and sought the fire and lit a cigar and a sigh of relief. Mister Fortune, what was in the telegraph? Sally cried. Reggie sat down on the cushioned fender. I don't think you are really a good little girl, you know. He shook his head at her and surveyed the company. Broadly speaking, you ought all to be ashamed of yourselves. Except the colonel, please, Mister Fortune. I will never do it again," said Alice plaintively. Tom, he sat on the arm of her husband's chair and caressed him. All right, all right," he submitted. "But I say, Fortune, what am I to do about Missus Fox? She has done all there is to do. No, not a nice woman." Sally had out. Her small hands. Please, what did you say in that telegraph? Lomas, Scotland Yard, jewelry robbery, Colonel Beach's house, curious features, tell post office stop delivery registered package posted Christian this morning. Nine exam contents, Reginald Fortune Christian Regis. I don't understand. She did. Sorry to meddle with anyone in your house, Colonel, but she would have it. You won't have any trouble. But what's the woman down? The Colonel cried. Well, you know she's been led into temptation. When she thought burglars had taken her brooch, it seemed to her that she might as well recover from the insurance people for something else too. That's the worst of playing at crime, Mrs. Beach. You never know who won't take it seriously. What made me cast an eye at Mrs. Fox was her saying last night that she wasn't sure whether she had lost anything else. I can't imagine Mrs. Fox not sure about anything. She is sure she's an injured woman now, and I will swear. She always has an inventory of all her jewellers' shop in her head. She has," said Alice Beach pathetically. "You should hear her talk of her jewels. Heaven forbid! But you see, Miss Winslow, it's the old story. You criminals always try to be too clever. She thought it wouldn't be enough to say he had lost her diamonds." She wanted them well out of the way, so that the police could search and not find them. So she scuttled off to the post office and sent them away in a registered pocket. Thus, 
as you criminals will, underrating the intelligence of the sample policeman. My man Sam was looking out to see if anyone did anything unusual this morning, and he observed Mrs. Fox maneuvers at the post office. And you had her coat, Coston cried. Yes, yes, a sad story. She didn't really mean any harm, said Sally. Did she, Mr. Fortune? Reggie looked at her sadly. You are not a moral little girl, you know, he said. End of section seven.